Welcome to another episode of The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And with me, Rory Stewart. We're in an amazing place. We're in the Palladium. And I've just walked past a poster which revealed that in this very building, not that many decades ago, was one Max Miller. The cheeky chappy. The cheeky chappy, your comedic hero. Yeah. That's because you've not been to see Grace, my daughter, perform yet. But uh, So we are in the Palladium and it's... I felt a bit weird walking down Argyle Street from Oxford Circus to the Tube and seeing these big, what do they call them, sort of electronic visions of us up above and the place. So if, if I feel by becoming here, I'm like becoming a second Max Miller, and that really excites my vanity. Which of the big stars at the Palladium that you've seen up there are, are more exciting to you? We well, you see, I, I have a, very, a bit of a love-hate relationship with being all over the place like that. I like the platform that fame gives you, but I don't particularly like... I felt when I walked in, I was desperately looking for a side entrance as I didn't have to be seen walking through it. Maybe that's just, a, you know, conservatives are just a bit more vain. It's, it's, it's definitely my vanity, but I, was, I suppose I was trying to get out of you more. Is it Nat King Cole or Tom Jones or which of the performers here do you admire? Well, I don't know who's been here, whether... Has Diana Ross been here? Have the Four Tops ever been here? I'm a kind of... That's my sort of thing. I don't know the... The comedians, I didn't, I mean, I only saw Max Miller. It literally was the first name I saw when I came in. Oh, um, well, we have to get you to look at the list then. Well, no, there's like, a whole list just outside. We'll go and have a look. Yeah, yeah. We'll go and have a look. So we're here because we're doing two live shows, one tonight, Tuesday, one tomorrow, Wednesday. They sold out, Rory, faster than the Foo Fighters. Very good. Eh? Who's the Foo Fighters? <laughs> Foo Fighters, that's the nickname for Leicester City. <laughs> Very good. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, the Foo Fighters are quite a well-known band. So listen, we've got loads to get through. You've just been to Turkey to look at the fallout from the horrific earthquake. We're also going to talk about a little bit about Iraq, um, if not least following the reaction we had to the two podcasts we did on that. I'd like to talk about what's going on inside the SNP because it's, this time next week we're going to have a new Scotland First Minister and we haven't really done much on that. And then I think we want to have a very foreign affairs second half, China-Russia, Macron's problems, uh, and I know you want to talk a lot about, about Israel and what's happening there. So first of all, tell us about Turkey and what was... Oh, well, thank you. Like. So I was down on the Turkish-Syrian border, and I think a couple of things. The first is that 42,000 people were killed, and many of them in about two minutes. And it's beyond imagining those kind of numbers, those kind of casualties. When we're talking about you know, bad floods in Britain, you're talking about 18, 19 people killed and the whole country comes to a, to a halt. This, this is, you know, so horrifying. And a lot of the places around the epicenter of the earthquake that I visited looked a bit like Mosul after the fights between ISIS and the Iraqi military. The, the buildings looked like they'd been hit by bombs. I was talking to a man who, an old man in the street, who had been woken up by his building shaking He'd run out at, it was four in the morning, run out into two feet of snow in his pyjamas. First thing he thought about was calling his family, didn't get a reply, ran around the corner to his son's apartment block, which is about five minutes away, to find that the top four stories of the apartment block had fallen sideways. The bottom three had fallen right into the earth. He's screaming and shouting, and eventually he hears in the middle of the snowstorm the voice of his four-year-old and eight-year-old grandchildren. And they were in the third story building, which is now at ground level because it's fallen into the earth and the top's fallen off. And he gets in and he finds his son dead, his daughter trapped under concrete and the two grandchildren, apart from his daughter, are the only people left alive in a seven-story building by a miracle of the top falling off and the thing falling to the ground. And the thing I hadn't realized, uh, is that the tremors were still continuing. So there were two tremors when I was there, smaller tremors, but there was a big five on the scale tremor last Monday so that people go to bed and their room starts shaking again and they think the whole thing's about to happen again. And this has been going on for five weeks. And many of the people I was talking to are Syrian refugees who've been driven out of their homes by war. All, that, so they're already there as refugees? They're there as refugees. They've run away because there's been this horrifying war. And one of them said to me that the earthquake was actually worse than a war because at least in a war, there's 
they felt there was some degree of early warning, some they could understand, even though they hated it, roughly why Bashar al-Assad was shelling them, but with an earthquake, completely indiscriminate, totally uh, no warning and completely unpredictable. One building will fall, the one next to it's still standing. And what, what, were, they, what were they saying about the, the response and the reaction of the, of the Turkish government? So I saw a lot of the Turkish government. I sat with one of the governors and governors in Turkey are uh, senior civil servants. They're not elected officials. And he was actually the governor of the neighboring province who'd been sent down to help out. And it was pretty impressive. He was sitting at the head of a table. He was running a meeting with uh, the Turkish military there, with the local officials there. The maps were out. His sleeves were rolled up. Supplies were coming in. There was a lot of action with bulldozers clearing buildings. There had been a lot of tents set up for children. There were temporary schools operating. One of the things, though, that isn't happening there, which is what my charity Give Directly is doing, is supporting Syrian refugees and particularly people who are running small businesses. Who is that who you were looking at, the refugees? Absolutely. So I was focusing not on, not on Turks, but on Syrian refugees, partly because I think their lives have been so blighted even before they got there, and partly because some services they're not receiving from the Turkish government because they're not, not Turks. So we're trying to provide immediate financial support. And one of the things that these catastrophes show is how powerful cash can be because every family has a different need. And the problem with traditional aid, which sends food or sends shelter or sends toys or clothes, is that often isn't what they need. So, so it's really interesting because the reason that I did the leading episode this week with Rahima Mahmoud, leader of Stop Uyghur Genocide Campaign, is that you were there in Turkey. And she was making the point that only the United States have denounced what's happening to the Uyghurs as genocide. And that Erdogan, at the start, was very, very, very strongly for on the side of the Uyghurs, but was kind of pressured by China not to be. And she was nonetheless making the, making the point that, that Turkey actually has got a phenomenal record at, at least taking refugees. Absolutely. The refugees that you were talking to from Syria, how do they, do they feel that they do get properly supported by the Turkish? Or, and also more broadly, because it's interesting, like the, at the time it happened, the earthquake was like massive news around the world. It's kind of fallen off the radar immediately, hasn't it? Yes, and, and it, it's extraordinary given just the extent of the devastation and how much suffering remains. And, and the economies of all those places are completely shot to pieces. All the businesses have closed. Many, many people who can have fled. I think the, the challenges of refugees, the Turkish government has, of course, been very generous. I mean, they took in almost 3 million out of the Syrian catastrophe, and they've continued to host many people who would otherwise have gone to Europe. And these are part of the agreements which were struck by Europe and Turkey. And another million have been hosted in Jordan, and another million in Lebanon. But the Syrian refugees in all those places, I think, have many, many, many complaints, um, particularly Lebanon, where they really feel they've been treated as second-class citizens and they haven't really been able to access services. But these are countries which have huge strains. I mean, this earthquake, we talk about um, Brexit knocking 4% off British GDP over seven years. This knocked 4% off Turkish GDP in about two minutes. I mean, the, the damage is beyond imagining sort of hundreds of billions of dollars to, mm. to fix. And so the resources of the Turkish state are not that great. And I think one of the other things the refugees would say is that if you are Turkish, you have a whole network of friends, relatives that you can go to. You can return to your mother's village. You can go and stay with a cousin in town. If you're a Syrian, you're a stranger in the country. You simply don't have those networks which are supporting people. I've got to say, listening to you now, talking about it and talking about the scale of it, it does, I'm afraid, make me even angrier about Ms Braverman and what she's up to in relation to refugee and immigration policy here. I don't know if you followed much her, her visit to Rwanda, but it was, I found it horrific. I found it absolutely horrific that, Two things, really. The first is her demeanour. She's definitely caught the Liz Truss disease of loving herself and thinking that getting photographed in the most sort of glamorising settings, <laughs> one of which is a, a refugee camp that's being built and her making jokes about the interior design being so good she wants to see the interior designer. And the second was the fact that 
which I think is a breach of the ministerial code, not that this lot care about that, this business of only taking those media that are, as it were, on the, the right wing of our, of our And was, was that that's something you never did? You never, you never, when you went on trips, no. selected journalists you no. went with you? No, if we, we went, when we went on trips, we had arrangements. Sometimes you took pools. You might, you know, be doing a visit and you have just the BBC, but they're doing it for everybody, or just Sky, but they're doing it for everybody, or just PA. You might take a pool. But no, and the other thing I'd say is if we had even tried to do that, there would have been an absolute outcry. And I actually think those journalists who went uh, and their bosses are a disgrace to journalism. They should have said, no, I'm sorry, if this is about taking us because you want us essentially to be an extension of your press office, we're not going to play. But they did play. And so, for example, the Mail on Sunday, the Sunday Express, the Sunday Telegraph, all had headlines that could have been written by Suella Braverman's special advisor. Suella vows, Suella promises, Suella will, pictures of her... You know, and there's one picture which I'm glad to say the New European have put on their front page with the headline, we can be so much better than this, where she's, she's literally just laughing. It's very, okay. It's a bizarre image. Isn't it's it? horrible. It's very, very odd. And I don't quite know what she's doing. She's sort of, it, it's sort of almost like a slightly manic, isn't it? She's leaning back. We should share it with, if people are interested in the newsletter, but it's a very odd image. She's sort of leaning back, her mouth open, grinning as though well, she's... Well, somebody of, did one of those montages of Edmund Munch's The Scream of... Right. of, of and then the other thing I thought was interesting was that when she's here in the UK, she talks about illegal immigrants. And when she was there, she talks about this is going to be a great place for the refugees to live. And I just find the whole thing sick. And yet, you know, the Tories will be looking at the fact that the polls have narrowed a bit and, you know, that the, the, the policy in, for certain people is going to be very, very popular. I think, though, that when they get... What's his name? The vice chairman, Lee Anderson. He did an interview the other day where he said, like, we won the last election because we had Boris, Brexit and Corbyn. We've got none of those next time, so it's going to have to be about culture wars and trans. He actually said that. Mm. That is their strategy. Yeah. So this is not about... You've been there yeah. to Turkey to try yeah. and yeah. help yeah. resolve yeah. Yeah. an incredible yeah. Yeah. problem. Yeah. This lot yeah. are trying to exploit. Well, particularly the Lee Anderson, Swilla Braverman edge. And that was, and that was, I think, a conscious part of the way that Boris Johnson was doing government. It's, it's much less part of what's coming from number 10. That's more the right of the Conservative Party. Yeah, hold on, Rory. Number 10, the Home Secretary does not go on a massively high-profile visit like that without Rishi Sunak saying no, no, yes. No, 100%. 100%. But what they've inherited from Boris, I think, which is much less part Johnson. of Rishi's personality. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Much less part of Rishi's personality. Is Boris Johnson was very explicitly making every single cabinet minister get involved in these cultural wars. You remember Oliver Dowden on statues, mm. speeches in America. I mean really relentless policy of trying to do this. And I think, I don't know whether this began with Dominic Cummings or whether this is something that followed his thing, but definitely... Well, I think it began with Steve Bannon. Uh, definitely Swella Braverman and Lee Anderson are very, very much out there on the right of the party. So did you leave Turkey more or less hopeful? I was very, very, in the end, impressed by the range of response it, because the, the problem is beyond imaginingly awful. I also left... You know, with with a sense of something that we don't get so much in Britain, which is the incredible fragility of life. You know, I was talking to a, a Syrian who had been a wealthy businessman. I mean, he he'd done a his degree in Italy. He spoke fluent Italian. He'd had a business as an ophthalmologist, making ophthalmic products in Syria. One and a half million dollar factory near Aleppo, completely destroyed by rocket fire. His family all locked up because he'd gone on one demonstration against Bashar al-Assad. Goes across the border, tries to start again running a small Italian restaurant because he, he, when he was studying in Italy, he'd learnt a little bit how to make pasta and lasagna. And that has now been taken down by the earthquake. I guess it is a reminder that we, we in Britain are very lucky that for many hundreds of years we haven't lived in a world where these sudden eruptions of war and, and earthquakes can... Cause, and it's something that the Jordanians are very, very strong on saying because they really feel that Syrians are so close to them. They can see so directly mm. the sense of their but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. Well, let's stay in that region, um, Iraq. I don't know about you, but I was kind of a bit stunned by both the scale and the tone of the response to our, yeah. our two episodes on Iraq. Yeah. What did you, and what do you think? So you felt that you were feeling quite tired when you went into them because you've been actually very much involved in Gary Lineker on the BBC all week. And then suddenly I 
pulled you into those two things? No, I think it's. I think I was tired because yeah, I hadn't been sleeping for all sorts of reasons, but I I, I was tired and I was exhausted. It's funny because I've done several inquiries on Iraq, you know, including I think the Hutton inquiry it was like eight hours or something, and likewise the Iraq inquiry I was there all day. But I think because I was so tired, I, by the end of that two hours with you, I was kind of exhausted. I remember. Fiona took the dog out for a walk when she listened to it and she came back and said, has Roy Stewart turned into your therapist or what? Because she felt I was much more, I don't think I said anything that I haven't, I feel like I've said a thousand times, but she felt I was much more kind of I think maybe, open. Maybe tonally, maybe, maybe it's a question of tone. Yeah, and, but, um, it was, yeah, but, yeah. but it was, it was interesting, yeah. like yesterday, 20th anniversary, and I posted a picture of myself and uh, Rahima Mahmoud on the podcast and, and said how amazingly brave she was and courageous and about genocide, et cetera, et cetera. And got an avalanche of, we, we were back to the kind of, you know, you're a war criminal, fuck off, da, da, yeah. da, hundreds and hundreds of those. Whereas the response to our podcast was like, one of my relatives texted me from Scotland and said, I was really worried for you. I thought it'd be the usual social media avalanche. And she said, it's 90% wow, that was amazing. And 10% war criminal. I, I think, um, I think it's also that, you were prepared to give two hours to a pretty serious detailed conversation, which doesn't happen in the media. I mean, I'm sure that this is a general theme, but I'm sure if you try to pitch to BBC or ITN two hours of you and me just talking, just, about, just talking yeah. about the details of the Iraq war. And as it was, you know, extraordinary sort of, you know, I can't remember what it was, but Dom said something like 800,000 people listened to it, 800,000 individuals. And it, it's, it's sort of mind blowing. And I think that, I, it's really encouraging that people are prepared to give the time. And I, and I thought you were actually um, more open than I've heard you before. And I thought you, one of the reasons people say that you were quite brave is that obviously people know that there is an entire massive group of people out there who, as you say, see you as a war criminal, a liar and all this kind of stuff. And you did your best to try to talk your way through the issue and, and help people understand it. I listened to yeah. the BBC one, Gordon Carrera, um, which actually I listened to it on the, on the drive up to Manchester City Burnley, which I'm sure you were watching, Rory, where we, we, we played really, really well. Really, we were, did we were the better well. team, but, better but team. they just scored six goals and we didn't score any. So one of those games <laughs> where the better team lost. Um, so I, li I was listening to it and I actually, I was so, enjoy is the wrong word, but I was so into it that I ended up listening to the, the last 20 minutes of the last episode inside the stadium with the noisiest match build-up going on in the background. But I thought Gordon Crow did a, a good job. He told a very complicated story well. He obviously spoke to a lot of the key players, not all of them, but a lot of the key players. And I think ended up in, in the same place as you, actually. Very, very, very critical of... Uh, I think I got I sensed in his questioning and I sensed that Richard Dearlove in particular... Um, Richard Dillove, who was who was head who of MI6. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and that the intelligence and then and also it was it was quite jarring for me to hear, because we talked a little bit about how the Americans were so kind of up for it, certainly the Cheney side, and that very much came through Gordon's interviews as well. And there were Americans there essentially saying that nobody could stop them. Um but I thought it was it was interesting. It was also an interesting thing. I mean, I, it, probably more upsetting for you, but there was an interesting article in the Guardian by Armando Iannucci, who did the thick of it, which you know, in a sense, gave you a huge burst of fame as you were reinvented as this character. But he wrote a very very angry piece saying that actually he'd been driven to create that series out of his anger about the Iraq War. Mm. But again, he's not. One of the things he says in the article is it's not so much about the individuals. He's not really particularly having a go at you or Tony Blair, but the entire system and the way that bureaucracies and systems get themselves in these surreal positions. I mean, mm. I, I, I felt this with COVID, that the first weeks of COVID from end of February to the middle of March, so almost exactly, I guess, three years ago now, how the British government again, got itself in the most incredible, totally irrational knots that anyone from the outside could see were mad. And yet, chief scientific advisors, chief medical officers, secretaries of state for health, cabinet meetings, were saying things which were patently bizarre. You know, I was being attacked on 
by the deputy chief medical officer for suggesting people wear masks. She was saying there's absolutely no evidence that masks make any difference. People were saying the fact that Actually, people... I remember that. She did that um, bizarre little photo call in, in the Downing Street green room with Johnson saying to her, you know, like people going to tell them, should they wear a mask or wear a mask? And, and, or it will sort of get them, you know, hands to nose and make it worse. And she said, no, I think there's considerable evidence that wearing a mask can spread the virus. No, it was ex- looking back, it's like no, it's, crazy. It's extraordinary. And there was a lot of that stuff. And, you know, strange stuff. Like, you know, a lot of people already in a very bad situation in Milan and the hospital's filling up. Mm. Clearly just two weeks ahead of us and seven flights a day coming in from Milan mm. and nobody doing anything. But, I mean, Now, I think we should close on a wrap. We'll just yeah. say yeah. that one of our many, many listeners inside the Conservative government, Johnny Mercer, felt we didn't focus enough on those who lost their lives. And I think he maybe has a, has a point on that. What I think I was struggling with last week was I feel a pressure, particularly from the media. I don't get it with the public. In fact, funny enough, yesterday I was at uh, King's College, London, where there's now a master's degree course in the Blair years. It's been going for a few years now. And I went along, there's about 40 people, all doing different aspects of the Blair government. And, and all of whom you said in a tweet almost knew more about it than you do now. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. They're amazing. But, uh, but it's interesting how even on the 20th anniversary... Very few questions actually were about Iraq. There was a lot about uh, public sector reform, a lot about election strategy, a lot about Tony and Gordon and their relationship, a lot about uh, Ireland. So I feel the pressure less from the public and less from academia, but within the media in particular, I feel this pressure that they, what they really want me to say is it was six of one, half a dozen of the other, which I'm just not prepared to do. And I feel that if I do... When I am talking about veterans and loss of life and so forth, I sometimes feel that that, that, that I'm, I'm I'm heading in that direction. And so, but I, so I think we should just both of us put on record that we accept we didn't focus that much on veterans, uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't feel it very very deeply. And actually, I don't know if I've told you this, but I've I've been writing a novel about a veteran, uh, no. which I suspect is all... and your and your your brother was a veteran. Yeah, so, so yeah. His connection there. I mean the the. I think it's a very, very um, powerful, painful problem because soldiers are risking their lives and being killed. But it ha- it's a double-edged sword, that, because what it can mean, I found, as somebody who became a critic of the Iraq war and then a critic of what we were doing in Afghanistan, is that the horror around the loss of soldiers' lives meant it was very difficult to criticise. So... Many politicians would say mm. to me, you can't say this because you would be implying that soldiers died in vain. Mm. And even with people like Johnny Mercer, I find it quite difficult to have a really clear sighted policy conversation about what we were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan, mm. because he will be so conscious of the sacrifices he made, the but friends that he, he saw I think killed. he agrees with your overall assessment, though, that the the intelligence people got it wrong, that the military top brass got it wrong, and that senior people in the Conservative Party got it wrong. So I think you and Johnny Mercer are very close on this, Rory. So it, it's, it's a problem, actually, particularly with military officers of all sorts, because one of the issues is that the military, unfortunately, shares in some of the blame of this, because it is often the very can-do attitude of the military that says to the politicians and the policymakers, we can do this. Mm. We went into Helmand in Afghanistan, partly because the military wanted to do it. And one of my biggest problems arguing against what they were doing was not paradoxically with the politicians, Mm. because often the politicians are very insecure when dealing with the military. They don't know much about military affairs. They don't feel very comfortable challenging them. If a general, and the classic example, the most extreme example was that Obama was very reluctant to get involved in the surge. And General Stanley McChrystal, who's a friend of mine, but is a big guy like you with medals all over his chest, walks in, says to the president, and then leaks to the Washington Post effectively, I need 40,000 more soldiers. Mm. And it's then almost impossible for Obama to to, talk. And and it's the same story in a sense that if I really try to say, which I did have to say in Helmand, you guys are really not making things better. Right, things are not improving. You're creating more enemies. You're killing a lot of people. That is very, very uncomfortable yeah. for people, even even junior officers on the ground, who want to believe that what they're doing is worthwhile. And a lot of you know, I got a a nice note from 
uh, Major General James Cowan, who was a key player in the uh, as a, 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 um, a regimental commander of the Black Watch when they went into Fallujah in Iraq. But he is still, you know, pushing back a bit mm. on my criticism. He wants to say, you know, Baghdad's changed a lot. There are elections. There's now a gay bar That's in true. Baghdad. It's a diff- different place. Those things are true. And those things are true. Um, but boy, oh boy, last time I was in Baghdad, mm. it didn't feel like the kind of place you were going to nip out to a gay bar. I mean, you're stuck behind a lot of big uh, concrete barriers, barbed wire, Humvees in the streets, militia everywhere. It's it's a terrifying place still the rock, I'm afraid. Okay, well, listen, let's take a break and we'll come back and talk about SMP, China, Russia, bit of France, bit of Israel. This week's Rest is Politics is sponsored by The New European. And as regular listeners will know, I am the paper's editor at large and have been a big fan of the paper since it launched immediately after the Brexit referendum. This week, I have been incredibly proud of the way it's conducted itself. It's called out the Stop the Boats legislation in a direct, bold way. Great example of how important independent press is when so many of the mainstream titles have just become PR machines for this government, not least those who went to Rwanda with Mrs. Braverman. Now, the T-shirt they produced with the slogan, It's People, Not Boats, sums up, I think, rather cleverly everything that's wrong with Suella Braverman and the awful legislation she's trying to force through. And I saw you, Alison, modelling one of these T-shirts on the way to that uh, football match, which you... Don't want to talk which about football too much. match, Rory? Which football match Sorry, are you talking we, about? We don't want to mention that football uh, the, the, match. One yeah. of the, I normally complain the New European doesn't have enough football, but this week it's going there's to, no should, such we're thing. We're not going to talk about that Burnley <laughs> match. Yeah, Burnley, no, Manchester City has just taken out. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. And when I, having posted that photo on Twitter, I've had many, many requests from people asking where they can get one. Well, I'll tell you the way to get one for absolutely nothing. You subscribe to the New European. And for just £1 a week, you can get full digital access to all their journalism. For £2 a week, you can get the newspaper delivered to your home every single week. And these are the best deals you're going to get. And every new subscriber will get one of the T-shirts that Rory so admired with the slogan, It's People, Not Boats. If you went to a shop to buy it, you'd pay £24.95. And you went for the one in the Burnley Claret colours. I did, I did. But we played in black, which is how I felt at the end of the day. Anyway, just go to www.theneweuropean.co.uk forward slash TRIP. That's www.theneweuropean.co.uk forward slash trip. So welcome back to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And here we are, live, as it were, in the London Palladium. Mm. And... You, I think, have been having sneaky, beaky secret meetings with the SNP. Is that right? I've been having conversations with people that I know. Very good. I mean, sneaky, beaky. Is that, a, is that an Etonian phrase? No, it's a... It's, 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 <laughs> it's always a sneaky, beaky. It's a spy. It's a spy. Oh, beak. Beak. Got it. Got it. A, so, no, I, I, if you think about it, Rory, you live in Scotland when you're not in Jordan. Yeah. And within a week, we'll have a new first minister after a long period of absolute dominance by first Alex Salmond and then Nicola Sturgeon. And I think this is a, a pivotal moment for Scotland, but also I think possible implications for the general election as well, because I, I do feel that a lot of what's happening at the moment could open the door to Labour and really strengthening them in Scotland. Which, which, which would be amazing. So just to remind listeners again, Scotland was a huge Labour heartland and was all the way from the Second World War through. And I, when I came into Parliament in 2010, Labour still had a very commanding position in Parliament and was mocking um, the Conservative Party for the fact that there were twice as many pandas in the Edinburgh Zoo as there were mm. Conservative MPs. There was only one Conservative MP, David Mundell, just north of the border. And then there was a catastrophic collapse of the Labour position almost overnight in Scotland, so that they ended up back in the comical position of the panda in the yeah. Edinburgh Zoo. Ian Murray was the... Uh- 50% yeah. of the pandas. From which they've been trying to build up again with some interesting things like Douglas Alexander, your friend, the veteran Labour cabinet minister, now prepared to stand for a seat in Scotland. But it will be very helpful, to put it mildly, for Keir Starmer if they can really rebuild a position in Scotland and, and really helpful for the cause of, that I believe in deeply, which is keeping the union together. So we've got three candidates. And what my sneaky beakies yeah. telling me, Rory, yeah. is that the disruption that is being caused, that a lot of it is being driven by Alex Hammond, 
that Ash Regan, who was this third candidate that nobody really expected, essentially is very close to him. Independence fundamentalist, I believe they call her. And, and, that's, and that's an interesting one because, of course, she, her supporters listening to this will be very angry about this because, again, to remind listeners, Alex Salmond is not exactly, although, you know, both of us are quite fond of him, it's a bit of a political liability to be seen too much as Alex Salmond's candidate because he is... Well, he got himself in real trouble, didn't he? Yeah, well. he, got, yeah. he kicked out and set, set up his own party. Alba. Yeah. So she's not going to win, and I think even her supporters would accept that. So the choice of first minister is going to be between Kate Forbes, who is very socially conservative. Yeah, and, and as I say, I mean, she, she's a wee free, so she comes from the Free Church of Scotland, which is uh, generally seen as a more socially conservative end of the Church of Scotland, Presbyterian yeah. Church of Scotland. And yeah. probably closer to that salmon wing, as it were, than well, the progressive she, wing. She's certainly anti Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, she is very much campaigning as the change candidate and trying to portray Hamza Yusuf as the continuity candidate. Yeah. And that's because four of the existing cabinet have already come out for him from a very small cabinet of whom two of them are actually running and Nicola Sturgeon won't declare. So he's very much... Well, interesting. I don't know if you saw Nicola Sturgeon's parents have come out for Hamza Yusuf and her sister... Gillian did a Facebook post that said, I would rather vote Tory than vote for either of these two, meaning Forbes and Regan. And she said, we all know what their game is and we all know who's pulling the strings. Well, this is all part of the whole thing. So, so basically, there is a huge fight within the SNP. And Hamza Yusuf is the establishment candidate allied to Nicola Sturgeon, allied to her husband, who was the chief executive of the SNP. He's just had to resign. He's just had to resign. And he's had to resign. I mean, just before we get back to the race, I mean, there is something very, very strange about that whole thing. Now that Nicholas Sturgeon's left, and now things are coming unraveled, we're beginning to see how very odd it was. He continued as the chief executive of the SNP, married to the leader for years, and nobody seemed to see any conflict of interest. Nobody thought it was weird. Nobody suggested he should stand down. And it's now becoming clear that there's an investigation about £600,000 of donations, the SNP, which nobody seems to be able to track down. He lent the SNP £107,000 of his own money short before he stepped down. And the Sunday Mail produced a story saying that the membership of the SNP had collapsed, that it had collapsed by 30000 at which point the chief press spokesman for the SNP came out, came out and said, the reporting is not just wrong, it's flat wrong by approximately 30,000. Having been given the figures by, it would seem, Peter Morell. And he's now had to resign because it turns out the Sunday Mail was right. Yep. That the membership of the SNP has collapsed since 2001 by about 40%. And they were trying to cover this up. It was quite refreshing, though, that somebody fairly senior in a political party and a government chose to resign. Wait, he was uh, Unlike... Unlike others. Yeah. Well, he seems to have real cross-party um, respect, actually. The Murray foot. Yeah. Yeah, he does. P people seem to like him. Well, I, let's just quickly on this, because you, you, this is very much your world. What does it feel like? And, and how do you get yourself in the position of going out and saying that brutally to the Sunday Mail, this is a lie, this is complete nonsense? Because you go, as the, the press officer, you would go to the people who you assume have the knowledge at their fingertips and you take their reaction as, as gospel. Some of the worst situations we got into were where you ask the people who are at the centre of something uh, what the facts are, and you rely on them. Um, and, and because it, that's uh, the only way you have of establishing and, the facts. And in a sense, he felt he had to resign. Why? He felt he had to resign because he had fundamentally misled um, a reporter who had asked him a specific question. He could have said, I don't have the figures. He could have said, I don't know. But he'd obviously gone to check, asked the people who knew, and was misled. Now, of course, they're now saying he wasn't knowingly misleading and blah, blah, blah. We're into the kind of the semantics. But I, I, th I also think it was interesting that it happened at a time when we have this incredible charade of Johnson, you know, when I don't believe there's a person on the planet who doesn't think he's a liar and that he lied to Parliament, but that he's sort of, you know, got this taxpayer-funded lawyer telling him how to get Did out. Did you see the brain. wonderful cartoon today? Which, of the Bear which, in the Woods? The Bear in the Woods, yeah. Oh, my God. That was actually one of God's time, wasn't it? So, yeah. So the bear's, the bear's sitting on his loo in the woods reading a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> and it said, Boris, I didn't lie. Yeah, yeah. is Boris Johnson a liar? Yeah. yeah. So I think it is very, very 
it's very hard to call. I think the other thing, there's a lot of anger in the SNP membership that particularly Kate Forbes, actually, I think people have been surprised. She really went for Hamza in one of the debates. She pulled back yep. later. Yep. She basically said he was a useless yep. minister. Yeah. Um, and so, she's called Nicola Sturgeon's government a mediocre government. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because Salmon, first Salmon and then Nicola Sturgeon have been so dominant. Yeah. The next leader is not going to be able to bring things together easily very quickly. And meanwhile, by the way, very quietly under the radar, Keir Starmer's been up there literally every week at the moment. Well, and also the generational change. So I, I was thinking about this in my own little political career. So, We've gone from a world that I first knew of leaders like Blair and Theresa May, who were born in the 1950s, to then the world that I went into 2010, 2015, of leaders born in the 1960s, like David Cameron and Keir Starmer. Then we shot with the conservative leadership race with Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak into leaders born in the 1970s. Kate Forbes is born in the 1990s. I know. I know. I mean, it's, it's a real shift, which means that, you know, all the things we assume are part of the living memory from Mm. the fall of the Berlin Wall, the financial crisis, all this stuff is is, is stuff which is, you know, either before she was born or or part of her childhood. I did an interview yesterday with BBC. They're doing lots of stuff in preparation of the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And I did it at King's because I was about to do these students. Apart from the mature students, not a single one of them was born before we came to power in 1997. Not one. And we're making the point that for a generation that's grown up in Northern Ireland, say, I mean, there's obviously collective memory of the violence, but there's no actual memory for a whole generation now. So, yeah, Kate Forbes will be one of the, if she wins, and, you know, she might well win, uh, she'll be one of the youngest political leaders in the world. Good. So let's talk about two leaders who are, shall we say, at the other end of the <laughs> political longevity scale, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. So... China is really pushing to portray itself as it moves into a position of being a major global power, also as a peacemaker. So the first big news, which was genuinely astonishing. Saudi and Iran. Yeah. China brokered Mm. diplomatic relations between Saudi and Iran. And to remind people, that split between Sunni Islam, represented by Saudi Arabia, and Shia Islam, represented by Iran, has been fundamental to all the problems in the Middle East, certainly since the invasion of Iraq, but of course, a long time before that. And British foreign policy for my whole time in the foreign office was all about what can be done to try to build bridges between Sunni and Shia populations. And Saudi Arabia has a very large Shia minority population of its own. Bahrain is torn apart by Sunni-Shia conflict. Yemen has seen a group called the Houthis, who are related uh, to the Shia, being funded by Iran, attacking Saudi Arabia. And these fights, these proxy wars in which missiles supplied by the Iranians are being fired by UAE or Saudi, drove the Abraham Accords, where Israel had a reconciliation with Saudi and UAE, which was anti-Iranian. So China pulling this off has pulled off something that The Europeans have completely failed to do. The United States has completely failed to do. And it changes a lot of the mechanisms in the region. Do you think as well that if if that had been an American president, say, who had been at the centre of that, it would have been like a huge global thing. And actually, even you and I, who follow it quite closely, I was trying to work out what what is the actual nature of the deal, what has actually been agreed. And it's quite vague. But what they have done is managed to get two competing, essentially warring powers, real powers, to say, we'll stop. And it is quite an achievement. It's extraordinary. So they've reopened diplomatic relations. Embassies will reopen. Ambassadors will be exchanged. Israel will now be very nervous because they'll be worried that Saudi is no longer going to be a reliable counterbalance against Iran. Uh, Saudi will be hoping this will give them benefit in Yemen. Iran will hope that this is going to give them more security guarantees, and they will hope that Saudi will begin cooperating with them on trying to do what Iran now claims it wants to do, which is civil nuclear power. Mm. In the meantime, the tragic story of the demonstrations against the Iranian regime, which we've covered, and where I was under so much criticism, as maybe you were too, my inbox full of angry Iranians, 
because I'd said that I thought that this revolution wasn't going to be able to topple the regime. And they really wanted to hear that we were going to, this was the one that was going down. The Iranian regime may well see that. And the fact that the Russians are now providing the Iranians with uh, fighter jets as all part of the Iranian regime stabilizing the whole, its relations the whole, with the region. The whole thing is also part of this, this bigger picture where China is asserting its own power and strength and authority on everything. And they've done it economically, not least in your part of the world and, and, and in Africa. They've done it politically and geostrategically. And that's why I think that I'm not sure that Xi and Putin will necessarily even have seen their visit through the lens of Ukraine. I think they see it as a much bigger. So we the, here, and I suspect in the United States and most of Europe, it will have been covered as this is, this is China showing its, whether tacitly or, or overtly, its support for Putin in relation to Ukraine. But I'd say the bigger message that they're showing is the Americans are no longer the big show in town and these authoritarian powers, you take us seriously or you don't at your peril. You, I think, and I think you put your finger on the main thing, which is America. What binds them together is that both of them are now feel that America has uh, sees them as an, a leading adversary. As we've talked about in the show, all the US Congress and Senate wants to talk about is anti-Chinese rhetoric at the moment. So it's not very surprising if both China and Russia are being targeted that hard by the US, that they will be looking for any number of ways to reassert a world where America is marginalized. And that's what in the end this will be about. And what, one, one thing, of course, to, to relate back to our Iraq pods that's quite striking as a statistic is that the US spent over $3 trillion on Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is almost exactly the same amount of money that the Chinese spent on their Belt and Road Initiative. And it's a really interesting two different choices over 20 years. And the Chinese would say they don't get involved in these military interventions. Instead, they save their money and they have created this extraordinary economic infrastructure and power base through the world with the same amount of money that but the US Ameri spent the on Americans war. will be worried that what the, the, the signal from what she did in going to, to, to Moscow and, and, and the, this kind of really ostentatious display that they put on together, that the next step might be military support. Yeah. I, I also encourage people to listen to your uh, leading pod interview um, uh, about the Uyghur issue. And, and just to remind people there that this is the, the Muslim population, Northwest China, a huge swathe in Northwest China, stretching almost towards Afghanistan, Central Asia, an area called Xinjiang. And these are not traditionally a Han Chinese population. In fact, they have links to Turkic groups. That's why there was a lot of support from Turkey originally. And they speak a, a language with Turkic connections. They were had originally an independent Buddhist civilization there. Amazing place to visit. If, uh, but at the moment, very, very sadly, uh, another example of an area of which Tibet is a more extreme example where the Chinese government has pursued a very deliberate policy of moving Han Chinese populations in, marginalizing the local community, demolishing a lot of the historical remains of places like Kashgar, which is this legendary caravan city. Uh, it was interesting, all, Rima, yeah, yeah. she said that the, the point at which she realized this is literally, is they're going to try and wipe us out completely, was when the official who'd been in charge of the Chinese Communist Party in Tibet was moved to Xinjiang and took over. Uh, I found, funny enough, <laughs> at the swimming pool this morning, there was somebody who'd been listening to it and, and, and actually said, and I, I felt actually, it's a real pity you weren't there, because I felt of all the interviews we've done, though she's the least known person, I found it the most moving. And, I mean, she told this story about a father and a son who were trying to flee, got in league with people traffickers. Um, the people trafficker said, well, only one of you can go on this flight. We've only got one seat left, but the second one can come later. So the father said to his son, will you go? And the next time he heard of him, his son was in Syria with ISIS as a suicide bomber. I mean, it went, and the way she told us the story about her last phone call with her brother, who basically said to her, look, just never phone us. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And the point she was making about China as a power she was arguing that the only government 
that has actually called it out as genocide is Trump's America. And that, of course, is part of their battle with China as opposed to any life yeah, of the week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's now exiled in the UK and she's trying to persuade our government to, 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 to come speak out up. And call it as it is. Which, which brings us to the incredible question of Israel and many, many things that would interest you in the story. So f- fundamental story is that there is an attempt by Netanyahu's government to try to undermine the position of the judiciary. Back to the basics, Israel has got a system a bit like the traditional British constitution with a very, very dominant parliament without a great deal of checks and balances, no written constitution, no federal structures, no upper house. And it's got a judiciary, however, which is independently appointed, not by the government, and which has tended to take some pretty liberal measures. So the Israeli courts have, for example, stopped some settlements. They took a big decision to exclude entirely one of uh, Netanyahu's ministers mm. because he had was a repeat offender on tax. In fact, he was in jail for mm. two out of three years. Anyway, all of this has made the Israeli right very angry and they are introducing laws in the parliament so that the government can appoint the judges or have more control of appointment the judges and so the judges can't interfere in this way. And it's led, and this is where I thought it would be of interest to you, is actually led by a right-wing think tank, not in this case based in Tufton Street, but funded by big US billionaire money, very peculiar money, a, a guy who made his money gambling and whose training process for his hedge fund investors involves months of playing Texas Hold'em. Uh, anyway, this guy who's made many, many billions supports this um, think tank, which is called Kohelet, which is the um, Hebrew word for ecclesiastics. They always have good names, don't they, these right-wing things? Can I, you're always asking me, actually, I'm going to be mean to you, you're always asking me questions about it. My, my normal conversation with Alistair, as listeners will know, involves him saying, who's Peter Simpson? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, oh, you haven't heard of Peter Simpson. So this thing's called Ecclesiastes. What's Ecclesiastes? It's a chapter in the Bible. Yeah, and what's it about then? I've never read it. <laughs> so Ecclesiastes you'll have heard of because it's the one that begins vanity of vanities, all is vanity, very kind of gloomy. Did you read this last night or do you know No, this? no, I do know. I know about Ecclesiastes. I hope the Almost, Archbishop's not listening because oh, he, I, I pretend I know about the Bible when I'm the Archbishop. <laughs> and anyway, since then, there have now been huge demonstrations in Israel. Essentially- I mean, they, they have been, let's just put yeah, it into some perspective. Yeah. They have been massive. They've been almost French style. And they do seem to be having an effect because they, they, they've, have they started to water down the bill or are they sort of slowing down the process? Yeah, well, it's very, very odd because Netanyahu, who's the prime minister, has had to recuse himself apparently from the process. But Well, he's got a few judges on his case already, hasn't he? Well, so he, he uh, yeah, exactly. So to remind people of the conflict of interest here, he was facing the most extraordinary series of corruption charges. He was accused of taking 300,000 in bribes and gifts in exchange for helping somebody sort out their American visa and their tax situation. He's accused of getting positive coverage in one of the Israeli newspapers in exchange for using law to take out their rival. And while all this has been going on, driven by the judges, he's now coming in with a platform to try to remove the power of the judges. Do you think he wants to do this or whether is he being pushed to do this by these very, very, very right-wing people who he's had to take in the, into the government as a result of the election? Well, I think he was somebody who was traditionally made polite noises about the judiciary. But I think since they've turned on him and he's in danger of going to jail, his mm. sympathy for the judges is, has gone. I mean, but it, this right-wing people, I mean, I, I don't know whether you followed Smotrich, who, yeah. the finance minister. Yeah who is absolutely extraordinary. He's, I mean, far, he's worse than the guy that was being dealt with before by the judges. Yeah. So Smotrich is, you know, on record saying the gay pride parades is bestiality. He lives himself in a legal settlement. He's just been in France in front of a map claiming the historic state of Israel includes Jordan. He says the Palestinians don't exist. He shouted in parliament that Ben-Gurion should have thrown all the Arabs out of Israel. Yeah. And, and this guy is the finance minister. But you know what? <sighs> The, the thing about protest is interesting, isn't it? So I, I was looking at some of the pictures of the protests. I thought they were really impressive. And then likewise, we've had in France, where <laughs> poor old Macron, he's literally just tried to raise the pension age from 62 to 64. And 
<laughs> he's had to do a presidential decree to get it through. They've had massive trouble on the streets. They've had rubbish piling up. And it's not going to go away. In fact, it's probably going to get accelerated. And, and, and Parliament, am I right that the Deputy Speaker got shouted down by the entire Parliament <laughs> singing the Marseillaise? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Absolutely. Go, they're singing the anthem. The poor Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne, she had to go up there really without knowing whether by the end of the day she would be in a job. He came very, very close to losing essentially a vote of confidence. So you've got the Israelis protesting against changes to the judiciary. You've got the French out on the streets with this. Now, fair enough, our public sector workers actually put on a very impressive march on the day of the budget. Got next to no coverage, by the way. I, I didn't see it until I was watching the German television news that evening. But that was a pretty impressive thing. But what is it about Britain? Because I get the feeling that, I mean, our government, I'm not saying Sunak's on a par with Netanyahu. Johnson certainly was. But, you know, there's so much bad stuff going on in this country. And yet, well, 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 well that's what it is. I think the other thing that's striking about Israel is that the situation um, amongst the Palestinian communities is horrifying. Oh, the, yeah. the Palestinian Authority has lost all credibility. It's got an aging, corrupt leadership. And power is breaking into these very fragmented areas, which are surrounded by barbed wire and walls, all with their own fragmented leadership, increasingly radical. And in Jordan, certainly many, many of my Jordanian Palestinian friends are now concluding that the two-state solution is finished. Yeah, well, which is so sad. They're, they're, they no longer think there's a credible two-state solution. They're now pushing the argument to say, let us move the argument onto human rights for Palestinians yeah. within a single Israeli territory and demand the vote mm. within a single Israeli territory, mm. which they're not going to get. Mm. And they're doing it because they think that if they can move the conversation onto rights, they will be able to portray Israel as an apartheid state. But the people demonstrating against Netanyahu are not demonstrating on the Palestinian cause at all. No. Because the old Israeli left has disappeared. And actually, this demonstration doesn't have party banners. I've, my friend's been on these demonstrations, commenting the difference from the 90s. It's not, there's no visible organization. So what no is, real, it? is it? Is it? Well, is it's, it's a sort is of, it the, noise, the, the silent majority coming out? It's a sort of Facebook revolution. It's like the Arab Spring. There's okay. no clear leadership. There's no clear, clear party organization. It's just a, a temporary coalition of protest and mm. disgust against what this right-wing government is doing to the constitution. And it's a fight between, in a sense, between secular Israel and the founding socialist origins of Israel and this new right-wing, more settler-dominated identity that's beginning to emerge. Well, that's very, really interesting. And I, look, this has been quite depressing, hasn't it, today? We've got to get our mood lifted before we go and do the Max Miller thing. I'm going to give you something quite nice to end on, though, Rory. We've got the, the builders have come in. Uh, so I've had to clear out my office at the top of the house. And it's just, honestly, it's just full of old rubbish and stuff. But I've, I've actually discovered some really, really interesting stuff. They classify documents. Are you, uh, are you, no, are you no, like this, Biden? This, this is actually a press cutting, Rory. <laughs> It's a press cutting from the Daily Telegraph. I don't have a date on it, but it's written by somebody you may have heard of called Boris Johnson. And the headline is, Just You Wait, Campbell. And the subheading is, Are we really supposed to believe that the media will remain forever browbeaten by one former mirror hack? I think that's me. <laughs> um, anyway, the final piece of this not very well written piece, trying to take apart my tenure as the Chief Press Secretary to the government, is... Alistair Campbell will look back on these months as his golden epoch. Let him enjoy his hour in the sun while he can, for already the political landscape is changing. The skies are darkening. Alistair Campbell knows the iron law of Fleet Street as well as anyone. It applies to him and his master as much as anyone else. The higher the media build you up, the further and more terrible your fall will be. It will be a grisly spectacle when it comes, but grimly satisfying, of course. And I see that you're reading that with some grim satisfaction yourself. I feel more than grim satisfaction. I feel happy satisfaction that the putrescence that is Boris Johnson and his wretched alleged leadership of this country is finally, I hope, being flushed down the toilet. So there we are. Rory and I have to go and lie down and rest and meditate and yeah. eat bananas and drink yeah. lots of water and get ready. And if you've heard some banging and noise in the background, we're right in the heart of London. I think there's quite a lot of building work going on. There is, yeah. Thank you. So, see you soon. See you soon.